Good evening, it's Dr. Alan Yim. Tonight I'm going to be showing you the concert program. This is a piece of paper or a booklet that's handed to you when you go to attend a concert or if you're watching a concert online, the notes that are given that you can read to explain the music before you actually listen to it. So I'm going to be showing you the most important parts of the program, what to look for, and then give you four examples of some formats that you might expect. Now, the most important thing to look at is the list of composers and the compositions. So here you see they're summarized. It has the list of the composers on the left. Oftentimes it's just the last name because we know they're so famous like Scarlatti or Britton that you don't need their full name. We know who these people are. And then the title. These other numbers over here, I'll explain, okay? Some of these numbers are people who have cataloged the works. So K and a number like this, 200 and something, something. Uh, if it's a letter like this, this is basically the chronological order of the work. Now, there is one specific one that I've mentioned before, OP, which is short for opus. These numbers are usually assigned when the work is published. So what's the difference between a number like K and OP? Well, the published work may not be the chronological order because oftentimes composers write a work or they start it, they put it in a shelf somewhere and they start working on something else. Later, they may pull it out and they publish it. It gets a late opus number, but it might be a work, for example, that they wrote much earlier. Now, here's what the actual program looks like when you open up the booklet. It oftentimes has the date it's composed. It'll have perhaps the dates of the composer. This gives you an idea of the style of the music. So if you see work like this, 1911 to 1979, that's obviously a somewhat, somewhat contemporary work, 20th century work. And I believe Nino Roto, Rota was uh, often a composer for film. Scarlatti, of course, a Baroque composer. You can see his dates there, 1685, 1757. Britain's a 20th century. John Adams, still alive. You can see here, still alive. And um, very recent, look at this work down here by Adam Wolf, uh, 2018. So this is a brand new piece, relatively speaking. Down below are usually a list um, or some exposition about each piece, explaining it. But this particular concert is a very casual one. It says live from our living room. So this is an online concert where the performers are going to be performing from someone's living room. And since it's so casual, they did not uh, take the expense to have program notes written for this particular concert. And in addition to that, it's so casual, I'm sure that they're going to speak about each piece before they play it, especially this last one, Cruise Control, because that could have many meanings and uh, it will be interesting to see what this piece is about. Now, something about the other part over here, you notice it lists the performers. So here we see there's a harpist for that piece. Well, all the pieces up here, there's a bass, a pre-recorded solo for bass, a piece for piano and violin, and I'll be explaining these kind of ensembles in a minute. And then here's a, the biggest ensemble in this right now. It's just a trio for piano, percussion, and horn. Um, I love percussion, and you can see here, it's not just one percussionist, but it, there's three. So there's actually five musicians in this piece. I'm sure this is going to be fantastic. Can't wait to hear that. Okay. None of the programs I'm going to show you tonight have what traditionally appears on the program, and that is an intermission. So normally somewhere in here, you would see the word intermission, and that's the break where you can get up from your seat, stretch your legs, go out, get a drink, go to the bathroom, um, and then come back refreshed. The programs that you see online generally are shorter. So if you look at the timing over here, 8-8, eight, eight, that's 16 minutes, plus 14, that's 30, and then another 15, 45, and then 58 minutes with the last piece. So 58 minutes of music, it will last a little bit longer than that with the talking. But this is a relatively short program. And even if they had an intermission, uh, it would still be relatively short, under an hour and a half for sure. So during a regular concert, of course, there's clapping in between each piece. Uh, the musicians have to walk on and off the stage. They have to reset the stage oftentimes. 
All of this takes extra time. So this program that's online would probably take at least an hour and a half, whereas online is probably going to be an hour to an hour and 15 minutes long. Okay, let's take a look at a program that's a little bit more formal. So you could tell this one's more formal just by looking at this picture here. And interestingly, this, this uh, performer here, this musician is playing with a mask on. I think that's what it looks like to me. So let's take a look at this. Now, this has three contemporary works on it and then something more traditional. So typically, if you go to a concert that has a paid ticket, there are going to be pieces that are familiar to the audience by famous composers, such as Dvorak. And they do this because if they only had modern pieces, they, um, the organizers, the artistic director and the, and the, so, um, the organization might be concerned that no one will come to the concert because people do like to hear pieces that they're familiar with. Chamber music, what is that? Well, a chamber music piece means that it's music written for, to be played in a room not a huge concert hall necessarily. So it's usually two to maybe 10 players at the most, something that you could fit in a large room with, an, with a relatively small audience, maybe 50 or 100. 100 would be a big audience for chamber music. But in this case, it's played in the concert hall. So if you see chamber music, don't expect to see the whole orchestra you will probably see um, on average about four musicians on the stage. So let's take a look at this one. And it says right here, piano quartet, the Dvorak piano quartet. Of course, quartet is four people. All right, the beginning of the program, relatively short, seven, nine, and 11 minutes. So that part is um, 27 minutes long. These are the contemporary pieces. So look at this. They give you the contemporary and then they give you the well-known. Now because this guy, Dvorak, is famous, he's a major composer, you pretty much know that this piece of music is going to be very high quality and people are going to generally like this piece even though it is more traditional and has been heard a lot. This piece is for violin, viola, and cello, and piano, which is a standard sort of group with piano. Some things to notice about this in the program. So, it's a quartet and it has four sections. The sections in this kind of a format are called movements. So it has four movements. And if you were sitting in the concert hall, you would have to pay attention closely because this first movement, you can see the whole piece is 37 minutes. So divide that by four. The first piece is, or the first section of it, the first movement will probably be six or seven minutes long. And it's going to sound somewhat complete when it comes to the end. It has to end uh, with probably kind of a rousing finale and you have some resolution. You might be tempted to clap. If you are unsure, traditionally, let's say before the past 40 years, you would not clap. You would not be expected to clap. You shouldn't clap because this is the whole piece, all four movements. Now, today, many audiences clap. In between or they're half the audience they're confused they don't know if they should clap one person starts clapping and then a group starts clapping i guarantee the not the, not the entire audience will clap and some people will be a little bit um i don't want to say upset but they would prefer that everybody just sit there silently and wait for the next movement okay you can think of the silence between the sections and before the piece uh, begins and possibly at the end as a frame like if you if you go to an art museum or a, a, or you look at a painting or even if you just have a, a picture at home that is displayed a photo you have a frame around it what's the frame for well it sets it off from everything else in music you need a frame as well and the frame is the silence around the music so you will notice that after the musicians come in and sit down Oftentimes, they don't just immediately start playing. They sit and there might be a bit of a silence before they actually begin. And that is that little frame to set the music apart from all the noise and to ensure that there's not noise leaking into the music because you want to listen to the music uninterrupted 
And especially you want to hear the beginning of the piece because that sort of sets up everything. And if you miss the beginning, sometimes you're actually missing a very important part of the music. So they need that framework again. Knowing the tempos will help because as you can see, it's fast, slow, fast, and then um, somewhat fast again. Knowing the format of this, the form of, of the piece helps you because then you could follow it and you could sort of sense when things are beginning and when they're resolving. So the more familiar you get with this music, the more you could kind of sense the proportions of the movements and you'll enjoy it a little bit more. Now, in the less traditional pieces, there's no telling what's going to happen. And honestly, um, I've never heard any of these pieces before. So on the other hand, it can be very exciting to hear a piece that you've never heard before because you just don't know what to expect. But then you really have to be paying close attention so that you don't get completely lost and you have a sense of where the music is rising in, in tension and where it's resolving. So this is the challenge of listening to contemporary music. Okay, so let's go on to another type of concert, something, a full orchestra concert. Now the New World Symphony is not playing full concerts yet. So they're having outdoor concerts where you could sit in your car and watch, sort of like a drive-in, and they're playing older works that from previous performances, and then some of the musicians will be there playing live. Um, but most of the rest of most of the concert is not live so this is a traditional type of orchestra concert you don't see the intermission here but you can see if you look at the dates on this one that all of them fall between 1800 and about 1900 so every piece on this program is in the romantic style which most people enjoy because they tell stories they paint pictures you can relate to it because a lot of times it sounds like early film music, um, but not all these pieces. So let's let's take a quick look through this to see what you should look for. Well, first of all, the date, because some of them are earlier and some of them are later, like 1844 and 1842. These are a little bit earlier in the Romantic. And then 1905-09. This one is actually Impressionistic. So the WC is just coming out of the Romantic period, it has a slightly different style less emotional in a sense, um, less, uh, the pictures aren't so concrete in this round dances of spring. But let's take a look at the first one, Overture to Ruslan and, and Ludmilla. Okay, what you need to know about this, it's an overture. It's a piece that begins usually an opera, which is the case here. And uh, so it, it kind of outlines some of the themes. It, it, it's usually a very exciting piece. Well, certainly this piece is. It's only five minutes long. So this exciting piece by this Russian composer Glinka sets the tone for the entire concert. Next up is this uh, Strauss piece by the German composer Richard Strauss. We've already talked a little bit about him with pieces by Don Juan, uh, not pieces by, but uh, Don Juan and um, Don Quixote, these two uh, orchestra pieces based on literary characters. Well, Eulenspiegel, uh, Till Eulenspiegel is another type of character. He's a very uh, mischievous character, so this is a playful little piece, 16 minutes long, and describes his merry pranks. So again, kind of happy. I don't know the round dances of spring too much, but we'll get to how you can learn about it, and if I read further, I will learn about it as well, even though I probably have heard this piece, I just don't remember. Okay, this one, the concerto, this is the most classical of the entire program. It's not a classical style, it is romantic, but it's very formal. How do I know this? Well, if you look down here, it has this traditional series of movements, three movements, fast, slow, fast, um, and I know the piece. So it's, it's a little bit more formal in its structure than these other pieces that we started with. So this is the more most formally structured, and it's a concerto, so it features a violin soloist. Um, really, really lovely piece. It's the longest piece on the program. So again, you would have to, if you were in the concert hall, recognize where you are in the piece so that you can follow along. Lastly, this another Russian piece by very colorful uh, orchestrator Rimsky-Korsakov, and this is Capriccio Espanol. So it's a, it's a caprice on Spanish, um, 
Spanish themed songs, dances, uh, and you can see here, it gives you the, the list of the five sections of it. Now, how to get more information about this whole concert, you go down here and you read about every one of these pieces. In order to do this, you can either, you know, go online early. Uh, I would recommend doing this before the concert, not during the concert, because of course, during the concert, you want to be enjoying the music and you want to already have this understanding of the piece. If you're going to a live concert, of course, you would read all about this before the concert begins. Since you're handed the program uh, before the concert starts, means get there early, you can kind of look at it. How long would it take you to read this? Is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Is it 20 minutes? So to do this, arrive in the concert hall early, sit down and take your time reading this so that you have an understanding of what it is about that you're about to hear. Okay, last concert I'm going to show to you. I won't explain everything in such great detail, but I want to point out sometimes you can have the privilege uh, of seeing a composer, conductor. So John Adams writes music in the minimalist style generally, and he also conducts it. So here he is, obviously still alive. I know John Adams not personally, but um, I, I've been familiar with his music for a long time. He, if you read his bio, he moved to San Francisco and there were some other um, composers around uh, the Bay Area and on the West Coast, such as uh, Lou Harrison, uh, who did compose in minimalist styles. I think maybe Terry Riley, I'm not sure, but you could read more about John Adams down here. And then some of the other pieces, he begins the concert with a piece by his, his own piece and then he ends it. I really like the piece Shaker Loops. So if you see this kind of a thing, or if you see a, a concert conducted by the composer, I can highly recommend it because you'll see at least the closest interpretation to what they intend, um, possibly. It's unadulterated. It's not interpreted by somebody else. Last thing I will show you, if you go to the New World Symphony website, every year, they get some new fellows, some stay, but at the website, they have all of the musicians on the website. You can click on their bios and you can see, read up a little bit about them. So for example, if you click on it, you'll see a picture and then a bio. A lot of these um, of them have very impressive bios and I can, um, it does, help to maybe know a little bit of something about these musicians. They generally come to New World Symphony for a period of three years. And then the goal is for them to go and get a job at a major orchestra. So they're taking auditions while they're at the New World Symphony. There are already graduates of conservatories. Some of them have their master's degrees. And I don't know if anybody has a doctorate, but it's possible. And they get into the orchestra by audition. So New World Symphony travels around the world and looks for the best graduates. And here they are to play in this orchestra. So I, I can highly recommend that you go and hear this ensemble. I feel very lucky to have this group down here in, in South Florida. And when we go back to live performances, of course, I will be there listening and hopefully I'll be there listening with you. So thanks for watching this video. If you have questions about the program, don't hesitate to ask and I will see you at the next video. Thanks for watching.